Welcome back to Talking Foreign Policy. I'm your host, Michael Scharf, Interim Dean of Case Western Reserve University School of Law. In today's broadcast, we'll be discussing the topic of U.S.-Russian relations in light of the Ukraine crisis, a relation that might be described as playing Russian roulette. We'll begin our discussion with Dr. Paul Williams, president of the Nobel Peace Prize-nominated Public International Law and Policy Group. Paul formerly served as attorney advisor for European affairs at the U.S. State Department, and he was recently the negotiator in Geneva for the Syria peace talks. Paul, thanks for a lot for being with us. Oh, thank you, Michael. It's my pleasure. So can you start us off by providing a brief update on the crisis in the Ukraine, where things are right now, and who the players are? Well, Michael, things are very tense right now in Ukraine. Um, as we know, um, earlier this year, in February and March, uh, Russia used uh, the situation in Ukraine to essentially grab the Crimea Peninsula, uh, to annex it to Russia, and ever since then has been destabilizing eastern Ukraine by supporting pro-Russian forces as they capture buildings, airports, uh, National Guard bases. You have a situation where Western policy is essentially in disarray. Uh, there's a promise of nearly $30 billion in assistance, no real coherent policy as to how that might be effective. Uh, early in the week of June, the G7 met, uh, came up with a, a list of threats, a list of possible new sanctions, uh, importantly did not identify that uh, Russia had to return the Crimea Peninsula to, uh, to Ukraine. And I think we're looking for a very volatile summer uh, with the Russians essentially accomplishing their objectives in eastern Ukraine by destabilizing um, the state of Ukraine and by the West spending a lot of energy trying to figure out how to respond and a lot of money just trying to keep Ukraine together. So you know, that's Paul, essentially it, the state of play. It seems like only yesterday you and I were working at the State Department in 91 when the Soviet Union collapsed, the Cold War ended, and all of a sudden Russia was our close ally and friend. So what's your take on how we got into this current crisis? What transformed Russia from being our friend to being, again, that scary bear? Well, I think what's happened is that we have failed to realize that the Russians have genuine strategic interests and that they're willing to pursue those interests by all means possible. So there's essentially three factors which have come into play. The first is that the Russians have very methodically addicted our allies in Europe to Russian oil and gas and you know the Russian um, financial profits from oil and gas. So Germany and Italy are quite heavily tied to the Russian oil and gas pipeline. Uh, the United Kingdom perceives itself as being heavily tied to the investment that comes into uh, the United Kingdom from Russia, mostly from the oil and gas industry. The second is that Putin is very strategic and how he approaches dealing with the West. So for instance, he's concerned about Georgia or Ukraine becoming part of NATO. NATO has a very clear, clear rule that it will not bring any countries into NATO that have frozen conflicts. So he creates a frozen conflict in Georgia by grabbing up Kazi in South Ossetia. Georgia's not in NATO. What do you mean by it's a, a frozen conflict? Well, a conflict, if there's any dispute of borders, if there's some um, uncertainty about the territorial integrity. You know, so, for instance, right now in Ukraine, the uh, Crimea Peninsula is you know, basically occupied by Russia. NATO, if it were to bring Ukraine in, would be bringing in an active conflict. I and NATO is not designed or structured to, uh, to do that. And then the third factor, just briefly, is that I think the Americans have been rather oblivious to the sort of march of, of Russian strategic interest. We, at the beginning of, of this administration, we um, had a reset policy and essentially decided to um, be kinder and gentler with the Russians. They have taken that to the bank and um, essentially undermined our strategic interests in this area. So do you think with their military and this new energy might that Russia is back to being one of the world's superpowers? I wouldn't say that it's a superpower, but I think they're a super player. We've abdicated much of, of the leadership on these issues, and you know, we can discuss that at, at great length later. Um, and we left, we left the playing field open, and the Russians, with a very weak hand, are playing it very well and are playing it quite, quite strongly. And you know, they've stepped in to, to fill the void that we've left. 
All right. So Paul's take is basically that this is somehow the United States' fault. I'd like to bring in Melena Stereo, an international law expert from Cleveland Marshall College of Law, who's also from Eastern Europe and knows the area and the players. Thanks for being with us today. It's a pleasure. So do you have a different take from that of Paul and, and what precipitated this crisis? Well, perhaps just a slightly different take. I think, you know, going back in history, if you look back to the the days of the USSR of the Soviet Union, they certainly were a superpower. And it was always sort of the United States against the USSR. And I think Putin is essentially reasserting Russia as, again, the number two, you know, superpower. And I think we can sort of dispute, you know, how deep that perception of Russia as a superpower is. But I think militarily, you know, there's certainly, you know, of course, it's like sort of the United States in number one, number one spot by far. Are, but then Russia might be, you know, in spot number two. Perhaps you can add China or some other countries. But but they really are reasserting themselves again as a superpower. And I think they're some of this is essentially reacquiring some of the territory that used to be in the Soviet Union, such as these regions in, in Ukraine and, and some regions in Georgia and other places. All right. So Paul has spoken of this failed policy in terms that sound like appeasement sort of raising the ghosts of the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain's policy toward Germany on the eve of World War II. So let me bring in Shannon French, an ethicist and expert who now runs Case Western's Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence, uh, but used to work at Annapolis at the Naval Academy, and ask her the big question. Um, (laughs) Basically, is it fair to compare Russian Prime Minister Vladimir Putin's policies to those of sort of Nazi Germany on the eve of World War II? Well, uh, thanks for the question. (laughs) I think that uh, it's seldom a good idea to try to compare people to Hitler. I mean, first of all, you're immediately uh, going to make people wonder if you've forgotten all of the things that Hitler actually did. Because once you start making any comparison, uh, it's it's pretty hard to sustain uh, the comparison against uh, his crimes. But I actually think the better question is, what's the point of that kind of rhetoric? If you start to call someone Adolf Hitler-esque and start to make those those kind of moves in your rhetoric, it's almost like the move of drawing red lines and saying, you know, this far but no further. You better be prepared to back it up because if you've just said that this is as bad as that uh, and then, in fact, you're not willing to do anything, then you make your hand even weaker. And I I think the focus of my question was more on Chamberlain (laughs) than on the Nazi leadership in And it can be applied to many circumstances. What it's basically, if you have a country that starts acting aggressively, and all the other countries in the world don't do anything, Mm -hmm. or they do something so weak and soft that it gives a green light, Mm -hmm. where will that country stop? Mm -hmm. So let me bring Paul into this and ask: Do do you think that we are somehow giving a green light to Putin to do more because we're not doing enough? Yeah, we we have no red lines, and and I take I take Shannon's point that one has to be careful drawing a red line. We drew a red line against chemical weapons in Syria. Pretty obvious. One should do that. Of course, it was crossed, and nothing happened. Um, there is a strong red line in the international community of territorial integrity. You you can't go and take a chunk of another country by force. That's exactly what Russia did in Ukraine. They went and they stepped across that red line, grabbed up the Crimea Peninsula, and annexed it to Russia. And the response has been economic sanctions on 14 individuals and a lot of meetings and, oh, we changed from the G8 to the G7. That's not a response. That's not deterrence. That's not seriousness in the face of a, of a canny adversary. And Melina, that's what going to cause us problems. Well, so let me let me disagree with Paul a little bit in the sense that I think it's much easier to draw a lead, red line against a country like Syria, which is by no means a superpower. Yes, they might have some scary weapons. They might have accumulated chemical weapons, but they're certainly nowhere in the realm of a superpower like Russia. So I think it's much easier to draw those red lines against non-superpowers rather than against a superpower like Russia. Now, c- can we be more assertive? Can we be more aggressive in, in the sanctions, in the threat of sa- sanctions? Sure, we can. But I think I think the idea that we're going to get into a military conflict against a super player, superpower like Russia is, I think, a, a lot scarier, right? 
and I think that this is where your parallel to Chamberlain c- comes into play. I think the parallel is this. Back in 1930, 1938, at the time when the Munich Agreement was signed, the European powers essentially agreed right, to split Czechoslovakia or to, to let Germany acquire parts of Czechoslovakia, trying to appease Germany. And, and perhaps that's what we're doing with Crimea. right? We're saying to Russia, essentially, you know, m- maybe you can take it. But let me just add this. Let's not forget that Crimea up until 1952 was actually a part of Russia and that Khrushchev at the time, the the Soviet president, essentially in a drunken game of poker, you know, gave it to Ukraine and that the majority of the population of Crimea. I've I've heard that story before. Is is there documentation that he literally (laughs) was drunk and and gave it away? This is what, you know, sort of historians have talked about. I don't think there's like a document that you can, you know, sort of point to and say, yes, he was drunk. But it is true that it was Russian until 1952. And it is true that the majority of the population. And at the time, he wasn't really giving giving it away because the, it Soviet, was all the Union Soviet Union but controlled the Ukraine. Exactly, anyway, but the so. Soviet Union had this federal wasn't system. Wasn't he from Ukraine? I don't think that. Yeah, yeah I think he yeah. was. So maybe so he, he was trying to, to say, yeah. yeah. But I mean, the it's Soviet Union had story. this federal system. And so it was a big deal to say all of a sudden you were, were transferring this piece of land to, 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 to Ukraine. And the majority of the population today is ethnically Russian. Not to say that I think, you know, going around and acquiring parts of another country's territory are a good thing. But, but, but you know, let's kind of not forget the, the, the context here. Shannon? Well, I can say more about this later, Michael. But Two of the criteria of just war theory are last resort and likelihood of success. So I very much agree with the point that uh, we can't be too cavalier about, well, you have to act soon and immediately and in extreme force. If you could stop things uh, sooner with sanctions and so forth, you are supposed to try that for the loss of life to be avoided. And so later in the broadcast, we'll be talking about the options and also the consequences. Mm -hmm. Let me ask this question, though, because I heard Obama's speech at West Point the other day, and he basically said that we have succeeded in our foreign policy on the Ukraine. And I want to ask Melina, what did he mean by that? It doesn't seem like we've succeeded at anything. Am I missing something here? No. So basically in that West Point speech, I think Obama sort of almost gave a, gave a, gave a, a version of this just war theory mm-hmm. in a sense by saying, you know, if our if our interests are, are threatened, if we're threatened, if our allies are threatened, we will intervene militarily. But in these other cases, we have to act more strategically mm-hmm. and we have to use other things, you know, things other than military force. So I think what he was referring to was essentially um, American leadership in creating some loose sanctions regime. I mean, yes, for, for now, those sanctions have been very, you know, meager, but perhaps, you know, rallying around Europe, trying to uh, come up with that, some sanctions, trying to work with our NATO partners, reinforce, reinforcing our commitment in um, Eastern Europe, getting the International Monetary Fund involved, getting other, you know, world organizations involved, and putting political and diplomatic pressure on Putin, kicking him out of the G8 group, which is now the G7. So sort of th- things of that nature. All right. So it's not that we aren't doing anything. It's just that we're doing things that aren't very aggressive. Well, it's time for our first short break. When we return, we'll explore the options and consequences of responding to Russia's annexation of the Crimea. Stay with us. Welcome back to Talking Foreign Policy, brought to you by Case Western Reserve University and WCPN 90.3 Ideastream. I'm Michael Scharf, the Interim Dean of Case Western Reserve University School of Law, and we're talking today about the Ukraine crisis with Paul Williams of the Public International Law and Policy Group, Professor Melania Stereo of Cleveland Marshall College of Law, and Dr. Shannon French from Case Western's Inamori Center. I want to begin this segment by asking Melania whether there is any plausible argument that Russia's use of force in the Ukraine was lawful under international law. Now, you've already mentioned that they just took back territory that Khrushchev gave away when he was drunk. But all these years later, can you just go across a border and do that? No, you really cannot. So international law bans states from using force against other states, and the only two exceptions to this ban are the use of force under United Nations Security Council authorization or the use of force in self-defense. Now, Putin has actually asserted this sort of variation of the almost like a self-defense argument by saying that he has acted in Ukraine to protect the interests of the Russian nationals in the Ukraine. And states have done that over the course of the year. So, you know, Israel intervened in Uganda, and there were a few other instances. But that's 
certainly not a valid argument under inter- international law to justify taking territory. And, and this isn't the first time Russia has done this in recent years. Didn't they also do it when they invaded South Ossetia in Georgia? Exactly. They went into Georgia in 2008, and essentially there are these two provinces in Georgia, Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and they've essentially created almost like a straw, you know, states or, or provinces that are now essentially, you know, controlled by Russia. They still officially belong to Georgia, but Georgia really has no effective control over them. Now, Shannon French, you mentioned before just war theory. Shannon, of course, is the author of Code of the Warrior, a wonderful book, (laughs) and an expert at just war theory. Do you think Russia can make out a case under just war theory here? Well, this is kind of fun because where we were saying that President Obama did at least correctly invoke just war theory, however you may feel about the policy implications. He did use the right language of just war theory in his West Point speech. Unfortunately, Putin doesn't score so well. I mean, if you look at just the core criteria of just war, well, the first one, Lena just uh, referenced, just cause. The only one that works effectively is self-defense. It has been stretched to the defense of others, but not in the way. uh, I agree wholeheartedly with her point, not in the way that he stretched it. And in fact, for him to um, shamelessly seem to be invoking something like R2P, responsibility to protect, uh, when he's been opposed to that in many other contexts is is just really uh, laughable. But then when you go through some of the other... So when you say the other context, for example, in Syria, when the other countries around the world said, wow, Assad is committing all these atrocities using chemical weapons, we have a right to go in. He said, no, you don't. Yeah. So how do you make the distinction? not only a right, but if we are truly going to follow the language of this this UN doctrine, there's a responsibility to step in. And he said, no, you don't. So it, it's hypocritical in the extreme. And then actually, if you look through the other core criteria of just war, it's, it's a no, no, no. I mean, for example, legitimate authority. Okay, you can say, well, you know, Russia is a legitimate authority. It's a, it's a sovereign state. But they've also been using uh, non-uniform troops and so forth to try to accomplish some of this. So even in that more basic category, they violated it left and right. Last resort, clearly not. Uh, there were many other avenues they could take even to assert what they were claiming. And then finally, the one that I think is the most obvious and egregious is a uh, right intention. Uh, the intention is supposed to be, again, to restore sovereignty, to restore peace and stability. Uh, territorial grabs were the whole reason uh, that just war theory was put in place to try to stop all that. So Shannon mentions this R2P, the Responsibility to Protect Doctrine, which is basically the modern conception of just war theory, more or less. It's been accepted in UN resolutions. And it was basically an outgrowth, as I understand it, of the 1999 NATO intervention into Kosovo when the NATO countries led by the United States bombed Serbia in order to save lives in Kosovo. And so basically Russia, who opposed that at the time, is now turning around and saying that's the doctrine that is accepted as international law and we're carrying it out. So let me ask Paul this question. What do you think the effect of Russia's use of the responsibility to protect doctrine will have on the development of that doctrine and its application in places where it really should apply? Well, Michael, quite frankly, the the actions of uh, Russia and the Crimea and the international community's response is is turning international law uh, upside down on its head. And, um, you know, I think quite depressingly, it's it's eroding the validity of international law. So let's just take, for instance, the responsibility to protect. It's it's a complicated doctrine which calls upon the international community to provide assistance to a country if its citizens are under threat. If the citizens are under threat because of the government of that country, the doctrine calls upon the international community to, to intervene in a way, uh, sanctions, arms embargo, and then in very, very limited circumstances, the use of force. What we have here is a situation um, in Syria, 150,000 killed, chemical weapons, brutal slaughter, barrel barrel bombs. Clearly there's a responsibility to protect. There's a legal basis for intervention to protect those civilians, and no one's talking about it. Crimea, there was a perceived threat against the Russians. I don't know if anyone was actually um, you know, injured or, or directly threatened. And Russia goes in, occupies a chunk of the country, and then annexes it to Russia and says, oh, we had a responsibility to protect. And you know what? The international community says, oh, yeah, yeah. We're going to sanction 14 Russian individuals because that was bad. So I think we've got a real problem here. If we're going to be serious about doctrines like deterrence, territorial integrity, sovereignty, responsibility to protect, 
we got to get a coherent and competent policy together to deal with what's happened in the Ukraine and to deal with what's happening in Syria. Well, let me Otherwise, let me ask. We're wasting a, our time. Let me ask a follow up to Milena. Do you think this abuse of the responsibility to protect doctrine will be sort of the death knell of the development of that doctrine? Because the other countries around the world are going to say, look how easy this doctrine is to use and to abuse. And we have to keep it sort of cabined up so that other countries aren't just invading each other and then using this R2P doctrine. Well, I think the problem with this doctrine is that the possibility of military intervention against a country that essentially uh, fails to protect its own citizens or abuses its own citizens in R2P, basically the, the, the assumption is that any military intervention will occur within uh, the paradigm of a UN Security Council uh, authorization to use force. So R2P doesn't actually authorize countries to stage unilateral interventions. It says, yes, you know, if a country abuse, you know, doesn't re- uh, protect its citizens, then the responsibility shifts to the international community. But if the international community wants to use force, it has to go to the Security Council. And so I think, and obviously, the problem with the Security Council is that we're back to this um, veto power that countries like the United States and, and Russia have. And so we know that in most instances, basically, one of the two is going to veto you know, the, the use of military power. And so I think that there's a, a fundamental problem with this doctrine in the sense that it goes back to the Security Council, and, and that's been you know, very problematic. And let me come back to this concept of appeasement that we were talking about earlier and ask Shannon, based on history and what we know about Vladimir Putin, do you think if the U.S. and, and Europe don't do enough – that if we look too weak in the kinds of sanctions, Paul said we're only sanctioning freezing assets of 14 individuals in Russia. Is this going to create a danger that Putin will act against other former Soviet republics? Well, I've already called Putin a shameless hypocrite. But on the bright side, I do also think most people would agree he's a rational actor. He was willing to do what he wanted uh, with regard to Ukraine because he could see quite clearly that the stakes were low, that he could get away with it, that no one really had the will or uh, the urgency to act. But he's not going to want to come up against NATO, and he's not going to want to test NATO treaties to that extent. He's not stupid. You know, it's the... uh, (laughs) Uh, we're not dealing with crazy stupid here. We're just dealing with ambitious and someone who is looking for uh, places where power has been maybe relinquished, as Paul was suggesting earlier, and he's going to move in. It's a zero-sum game, and he can move in where the U.S. appears weak. But he's not going to go up against any former Soviet Soviet republics that are now allied with NATO. That is not in his interests, and the stakes are too high. Well, and you know, we were making... uh historical analogies before to World War II, maybe the real historic analogy is to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Because aren't we really playing brinkmanship here? And you're sort of guessing Mm -hmm. what Putin will do. And he's going to have to guess what we're going to do. But we did a lot of that. And we almost went to nuclear war in 1964 during John F. Kennedy's time. Is is there any danger of, of misguessing and spiraling into something like that here? Possibly, but uh, and maybe I am overly optimistic here, but I do think that Putin has shown a certain shrewdness and uh, that he, he's not going to play it quite that close to the edge because he can gain more by not, by figuring out exactly where he can get away with things and getting away to the maximum in those areas and not making parts of the West and so forth so nervous uh, that they're going to really have no choice but to respond more and, more vigorously. And what about China? I'm sure China, which is becoming more and more aggressive mm-hmm. vis-a-vis its neighbors and its region, is looking at the West's reaction to Putin mm-hmm. and saying, what can we get away with? How far can we go before going too far? Well, and you know, the other side effect that that you bring up by raising China is that If people start to create this narrative that the U.S. is becoming, once again, very isolationist and is not going to be there for their friends, uh, then uh, countries that we have traditionally offered protection to are going to start to get nervous. And there's a potential escalation there that can make people uncomfortable. There have already been conversations like around the question of whether Japan is going to continue to feel adequately uh, protected as long as uh, the U.S. seems to feel like, hey, we really don't want to go anywhere anymore and and, uh, be involved in such things. So if the U.S. doesn't want to send those signals, Mm -hmm. then we have to do something more. And we don't want to go to war, as you all Mm -hmm. say, 
Melina, what are our non-military options yeah. that we haven't yet tried? Well, let me let me just pick up very quickly on something that Shannon said. You know, President Obama was just in Europe at this G7 summit. It used to be G8, but again, Russia has been kicked out. <laughs> and he specifically, in, in a speech that he gave there, he specifically mentioned that the United States will stand, you know, will be there for Estonia, will be there for Poland. So the specific reassurance that, you know, as Shannon said, we're not going to let Putin just do whatever. Well, like there, there is a red line, I think. Yeah, w- w- <laughs> but the president and red lines, you know, doesn't have a great history because of what he said with Syria and the number of times Assad crossed that line with nothing happening. So well, I'm I, not I think, sure if that's enough for well, him just I, to say, we'll protect you and list a couple of countries. I, mean, I, I do think that the United States coming away from two very deadly and long wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, I think you can see where President Obama is coming from in a sense that he's very cautious to commit our troops to yet another war. That being said, I, I do think, I, I agree with Shannon, that Putin, he He's like a poker player and he's sort of, you know, he's counting cards and, you know, he knows that, you know, if he were to go after Poland or Estonia, that I think then NATO would intervene. Did did President Obama leave anything out of that list? (laughs) <laughs> because he'll go after those. I'm just yeah. curious. No, is I, there any country or part I of a country that, you, like, did he mention Belarus? I don't think he mentioned, yeah, Belarus has not Belarus. been mentioned, or like Moldova, Moldova, or, you know, but he, but President Obama did use these rat, this rhetoric of aggression. So mm-hmm. he's specifically painting the Russian action as aggression, and we all know under international law, aggression is, is illegal. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I think he's sort of setting up a case that if Russia were to go after some other places, then, then, then we would. Okay, so, and the so U.S. To, wouldn't be alone in that either, Michael. Right. I mean, if he crossed I, yes, those lines, I agree. It, it would certainly provoke Europe as well. So to summarize, <laughs> we have economic uh, freezing of assets of 14 people, <laughs> and we have a speech where we say don't go into the following 10 countries. <laughs> There's got to be more to send a stronger signal. So well, what you, else could we be doing? Well, you, you know, for example, you could impose much broader economic sanctions. You know, back, if you if you remember the wars in the former Yugoslavia, the, the, the first, you know, thing that the international community did is that it, it imposed these very broad economic sanctions that had a devastating effect. So you could use sanctions a lot more effectively short of just, you know, yeah. freezing the assets I of remember a, a few people. When Russia or the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in 79 Mm -hmm. and the United States put economic sanctions, a a grain embargo on on the Soviet Union, and it just made our farmers suffer terribly. And then we didn't go to the Olympics and our entire (laughs) Olympic team were mad. So there's always this blowback (laughs) effect. Right. And if we do these kinds of sanctions, you know, the the immediate consequence is that he'll cut off the oil to Europe, Europe right. right? And I think that goes back to Paul's earlier point, which, which is an excellent point, but which, you know, let me emphasize that Putin very strategically has essentially created this dependency on Russian oil and gas in Europe, which was such a smart move, right? And we really didn't anticipate that. I mean, even in the Ukraine, didn't he give them like all sorts of discounts and suddenly he he's ju- not giving he them? He the- just mm-hmm. jacked up the price, you yeah. know, by like 80 percent. And yeah. he essentially is like, no, I'm not giving you the discounts anymore. <laughs> so, Paul, you've been quiet for a few minutes. Let's bring you back into the conversation from Washington, D.C. Um, from your perspective, what more can we be doing short of war? Well, there's two important things we have to do. The first is we actually have to get a coherent policy where we f- figure out what's happening. All of us on this on this program agree there's no real uh, military response, which quite frankly is the way it should be. The Russians aren't going to engage in military aggression against the neighboring states. They're going to destabilize them. They are currently destabilizing Ukraine through no military aggression whatsoever. They're supporting and providing assistance to pro-Russian Ukrainians who are destabilizing Ukraine, and they're having military exercises perfectly legal on the Russian side of the border. They can do this up and down their border and destabilize America's allies without crossing a line. So I think the administration... Those involved in doing the analysis have to be pretty clear that there isn't going to be a clear crossing of a red line. The second, we're all in agreement, no military response. So what is America's response? To reallocate $1 billion from the defense budget to move forces into the region, to add F-16s, to add special forces, to talk about will defend our allies. Obama, President Obama, is talking about a military response to a red line that isn't going to be crossed. And then the third is to think about the sanctions. We talk about how ineffective these sanctions are. What's happening is this crisis is costing us billions of dollars. The European Union, the IMF, the United States have agreed to contribute over $30 billion of assistance to Ukraine, part of which they're going to use to pay Russia for the oil and the gas that they're importing from Russia. 
were the ones who were suffering economically as a result of basically Putin very cleverly and strategically destabilizing Ukraine. When we talk about the pressure, the serious pressure that we're going to put on Russia if we have to, if he continues to cleverly destabilize their allies, it's important to remember that Russia's GDP constitutes 2% of the global economy. The GDP of the G7, 50%. Let's stop pretending to be so weak. Let's stop having a no doctrine doctrine. Let's sit down at the table and say, we have 50 poker chips, you have two. Do you really want to play poker over Ukraine and over our NATO allies? Or do you want to get serious about getting back in the box? Paul, there is something I want to follow up on that you said in your second point where you said that they're not actually crossing the line because they're working through indigenous Ukrainian people. Isn't this similar to what Slobodan Milosevic, the former leader of Serbia, did when he decommissioned the military in Bosnia and continued to sort of assist them and give them guidance and tell them, you know what to do. And they did his bidding. And he said to the international community, that's not us. That's not the Yugoslav National Army. That's the Bosnian Serb paramilitaries. I mean, isn't that exactly the same thing that's going on here? And in the end, wasn't he held legally responsible for his actions uh, in Bosnia through the paramilitary? It's what he did. It was highly effective. It paralyzed us and our European allies, took us numerous years to respond, and only after hundreds of thousands of deaths, genocide, did we finally respond. So Putin has the Slobodan Milosevic playbook. It worked once. He's seeing if it works again. We're at the point where we should take another short break. When we return, we're going to look at the strategic consequences of sanctions against Russia. So we'll be back in a moment. Stay with us. This is Michael Scharf, and we're back with Talking Foreign Policy. I'm joined here today by Paul Williams, the president of the Public International Law and Policy Group, who's broadcasting from Washington, D.C. And in studio, we have Shannon French and Melena Stereo here in Cleveland. We've been talking about post-Ukraine U.S.-Russian relations. Let me begin with Melina Stereo, our international law expert, and ask you if you can summarize the actions the U.S. and Europe have taken so far against Russia in response to the Ukraine crisis. So, so far, um, the United States and the European Union have imposed relatively minor travel bans and have frozen the assets of about 14 um, Russian officials in reaction to the seizure of the Crimean Peninsula. Um, those definitely, you know, appear very minor, are minor in relation to, to, to the proportion of this crisis. Um, additionally, um, Russia has been cut, of, cut out of the, the G8 and the G8 summit, which was programmed to take place in Sochi, Russia, was transferred to um, essentially Western Europe. And so now now it's, it's the G7 summit taking place uh, um, elsewhere. And so, so there's certainly sort of political diplomatic pressure being um, exerted against Putin, but nothing too major as of now. So far, has Russia retaliated against these or just made threats of retaliation? So far, Russia has only made threats against retaliation, but some of those threats could be fairly significant for the United States. And so let me just mention one of them. The United States to reach Afghanistan, to reach to supply our troops of, to, in Afghanistan, has essentially been using Russia as a route. So supplies get transferred to the Baltic states, and then um, through ground uh, routes, they get transported from the Baltic states to Afghanistan. And this and so, is because ever since we killed Osama bin Laden without Pakistan's approval, we haven't been able to freely go through Pakistan. Exactly. Right? We can no longer go to Pakistan. It's too dangerous. And so now we go through Russia. And we actually pay Russia about a billion dollars or so to, to in order to, to be able to use this route. And, and aren't but Russia they also, at our payments, providing military helicopters that the Afghan army is supposed to use after we remove ourselves? That is that is correct, yes. Because if we're, you know, we're going to remove ourselves, the goal is to then enable the Afghan army to be able to take over control and, and security. And these are the helicopters that they're used to using. And so they're the ones, the only ones that they can use. Exactly. Right? That's correct. So, but, so here we are, and our entire Afghan policy, who would have thought we'd come to this, <laughs> is dependent on going through Russia, paying Russia off, and buying Russian military equipment for the Afghans to use. That's that's pretty much correct. And and Russia, I think, has sort of mentioned this and could could potentially cut off these routes. This route, by the way, is called the Northern Distribution Network, and that would be a problem for us. 
Okay, and Shannon, you've mentioned also this aspect of oil. Mm -hmm. um, how much oil is Europe getting from it? Is there any real prospect that if we ratchet up the sanctions in the way that Paul Williams suggested we might, that they would retaliate by doing all sorts of things with the oil that flows to Europe? Well, I mean, first of all, the, the numbers are quite impressive. Uh, these are a little bit out of date, but I was finding that uh, somewhere around 35 percent of the EU's crude oil uh, co imports come from Russia. And uh, importantly, also gas is part of this mix. And 20 percent of their natural gas uh, comes from Russia. So that's obviously significant. Although I do take Paul's point that we are a significant player as well. But the... Um, the interesting issue here, I keep coming back to sort of the game theory side of this and how Putin is likely to behave if he is, as I've claimed, ultimately rational in the choices that he makes. It's a delicate dance deciding when you're going to cut off oil or, or uh, pull back uh, deals that you previously made. On the one hand, we have seen him do that uh, with Ukraine and uh, done it effectively. But if he starts messing around too much with some of his other strategic trading partners and people that have come to count on these contracts with Russia for gas and oil, he runs the risk of them saying, well, you know, we're going to have to diversify significantly uh, to avoid being this vulnerable. So long term, it could actually hurt Russia economically to make these kinds of moves that that actually are going to make people nervous about being dependent on Russian. Well, I mean, it's not really supplies. that easy just to diversify, is it? Because <laughs> Russia constitutes a large percentage of the oil and gas, and it's inexpensive because there's already these pipelines and they're in the vicinity. If they have to come all the way from the United States and go in tankers, it's going to be significantly more expensive. And so they're, the Russians, they can jack up their prices. They can do things incrementally to just send signals. And wouldn't it potentially negatively affect the economies of Europe and then ultimately the United States? Well, again, it's a delicate dance. I think that it, it can happen to some degree, and that is a card that uh, Putin is willing to play or has shown a willingness to play. But I think that he does have to recognize that this is another area where if he pushes too far, people are going to look for alternatives. And, you know, it's still a weak area of energy development, but people are also, of course, exploring other alternative fuel sources and ways to just simply get out of this trap uh, by um, using um, nuclear power, using um, other kinds of, of cr clean energy like uh, wind and solar and so forth. And if he pushes people that direction, he's only hurting the long-term interests. Well, let's talk about some of the other geopolitical hot spots where this crisis could have an effect. Paul, at the top of the hour, I mentioned that you had been in Geneva as the lawyer for the Syrian opposition at the two rounds of peace talks. And I know that they stalled out at the end, but there, according to the news reports, there was this hope that Russia was going to come in on the side of the peace negotiations and help remove Assad from power and create a transition and stop all of these atrocities. How's that working out, Paul? Yeah, not so well. Um, there was a bit of a uh, of a delusion that Putin would be our partner in peace. I think it's clear when you look at the Syria conflict, coupled with what's, what's happening in Ukraine, he's not our he's not our partner in peace. He's calculating. He's strategic, um, and I think we're. We, we have a lot of straw men concerns. Uh, you know what's going to happen in Syria if we're if we're tough on him in Ukraine. The same thing that's happening now in Syria is what's going to happen if we're tough. Um, same thing with, 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 with the oil. He's not, he's not giving away the oil and the gas. He's getting billions of dollars in return for it. If he cuts it off, he loses billions of dollars. How's he going to fuel his oligarchy, which is the structure that keeps him, keeps him in power? As long as the money's flowing, he's in power. If the money stops flowing, there's a real risk. Paul, is there I, any chance for sort of a deal where the United States and the West says, all right, we'll stop beating you up over the Ukraine if you work with us in Syria, maybe, and Iran, and, and maybe Egypt and some of the other hot spots. Oh, yeah, sure. But that would be the wrong approach because that would reward this type of this type of aggression. It would, you know, simply say, oh, everything is on the table. Well, I guess nowadays everything is on the table. But, you know, everything is on the table. We can trade this. We can trade that. We, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we need a, we need a coherent and a competent policy, which makes clear that there are rules, and these aren't new rules, territorial integrity, sovereignty, these are all enshrined in the UN Charter. 
it the world is a crazy place. These rules have kept it, um, you know, basically intact. And if you have someone like Putin who, you know, violates the cornerstones of the rule book um, and gets away with it, you're going to have these consequences, as you mentioned earlier in China. You're going to have the continuing consequences in Syria. It doesn't take much to say, get back, you know, get back within the box, play by the rules. Um, but you need a self-confident United States. You need a United States that leads our European allies. And, um, you know, you need a United States that's willing to, um, to, to be assertive, to protect its own strategic interests. The less secure the world is, the less secure the United States is. Let me ask Melena, are, are there people out there, experts, that say, let's use a different paradigm. Let's go back maybe to the old colonial powers and let's trade one part of the world for another part. If you ever played the, the board game Risk, you know, you know what I'm talking about. And, and let's just say, you know, we can't really stop him in the Ukraine, so we'll just stop beating him up over that if he promises to do X, Y, and Z in these other places. Is, is anybody saying that? Yeah, I mean, there's so even before the Ukrainian crisis, there were scholars writing about basically this theory of the great powers rule, essentially that our world is ruled by the great powers like the United States, like Russia, countries that can get away with things that other countries simply cannot. And I think while we have these rules of international law, it's infinitely easier to apply them to the non-superpowers, to the non-great powers, right? Because we can threaten them more easily because economic sanctions have a huge impact on them because they cannot retaliate against us in meaningful ways. I think when it comes to a superpower like Russia, the problem is that whatever approach we take, I'm not saying we shouldn't take an approach, I'm not saying we shouldn't be assertive, but whatever approach we take, there's a huge downside. There's a huge potential negative consequence of, you know, we can no longer reach Afghanistan. We can no longer reach the International Space Station. We can no longer, you know, Europe no longer has a gas supply, right? So it is very, very difficult to apply these rules to, to, to a huge superpower. And so I think by default, then you sometimes go back to this rhetoric of kind of saying like, well, all right, maybe we sacrifice Crimea, but we draw the line at, you know, Poland, right? I mean, it, it sounds terrible, but, but the reality might be that at times it's something you have to do. Well, and, and Paul was saying that Russia already was really being the fly in the ointment of the peace negotiations in Syria. But what about in Iran? I'll ask Shannon about this. Um, in Iran, it seems like Russia's been a positive player and continues to be, and that Iran is making some real progress in its denuclearization. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's not nuclear disarmament yet because they don't actually have, we hope, uh, weapons. We're just trying to keep them from developing them. But yes, I think we're back again to uh, what is in Russia's interest, what is in Putin's rational interest. And in that case, it makes sense. They they don't gain by having uh, a threat there. So it's, it's not um, where they're going to play that card because it would help them. It's, it's something that shows restraint. But, you know, Following off the points that we were just making, I think we do have to remember the historical aspect of uh, where U.S. isolationism uh, comes from. I mean, we do have a really long history of this. I remember I used to show my students at the Naval Academy a Life magazine from 1939. Uh, that uh, was polling the American people all across the country about how we should respond uh, to the conflict that was developing. And the choices included things like join the allies now, join the allies if they are losing, uh, join Germany now, you know, various choices. And then one of them was sell to both sides, cash and carry. And that was the overwhelming victor. It was hugely the one that people chose. Now, Pearl Harbor changed all that. Uh, and, you know, in more recent times, we saw the change in uh, attitudes that were brought, was brought about by 9-11. But our default mode is isolationism. We have friendly neighbors to the north and to the south. We don't feel that sense of, of urgent threat a lot of the time. Uh, we have those big oceans to protect us. And the appetite for use of military force is very low right now domestically. Well, and add to it in the last... 12 years. Mm -hmm. We've had two wars that each individually cost a trillion dollars and mm -hmm. probably were collectively the reason our economy went south. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and people remember that and are worried about it. So there, there, it, it isn't that surprising uh, that when we're looking at the foreign policy that President Obama is advancing, uh, domestically, except for the people who are worried about players like Putin, people are kind of showing relief. They, they don't want to hear that, oh, let's go 
go out there and kick some butt. That's not what the appetite is for. But having said that, it's not irrelevant what Milena was pointing out, that Obama had to go out of his way to reassure our allies. And I do think that is the piece that we also want to keep our eye on. How nervous are we making uh, some of the people that have counted on this sort of umbrella of U.S. protection? Uh, and you know how, how much are they going to start saying, wow, the U.S. really is pulling back. The U.S. really isn't going to be there for us. I don't think we've gotten to that point yet, but I think that's something to keep an eye on. You know, and you were mentioning sort of the, the population that would rather bet on both sides than take a side. <laughs> yes. Let me bring Paul back into the conversation. Paul has spent a lot of time in Egypt with uh, transitional justice, constitution drafting, and other work. Um, now, Paul, Egypt's a place where the country has at times been pro-Soviet Union, more recently pro the United States. We've paid dearly to get that support. What is this crisis in Ukraine and in U.S.-Russian relations likely to do to our relations with Egypt? I think what you'll see in Egypt is what you're going to um, see across the board is, and this, this ties into to Shannon's point, is it, it is the instinct of the American people to, to go with isolation, and, and, and that's fine. Although there are real and dangerous consequences associated with that, mm -hmm. and that's why every time the American people have gone with isolation, the executive branch for the U.S. government of a whole has actually come up with a, a doctrine which is more assertive and more aggressive than isolation. What you have now, actually, is the doctrine of isolation by the U.S. government. And that's got some dangerous consequences. In Egypt, we're not sure what to do. We're not doing anything. Expect Egypt to move over in the direction of the Russians. The Russians would like another Mediterranean port. The Egyptians would like a lot of military hardware. They're going to need it. And the Russians will provide it. And I think you're going to find, as we retrench, as, as the no doctrine, as a, so to speak, no doctrine doctrine, of the U.S. government laid out at West Point um, gets played out and we retrench from our responsibilities around the globe, you're going to find that the Russians are going to fill that vacuum either in a strategic way or simply to destabilize uh, some of our allies. And you're going to have a lot of anxiety out there. You're going to have an empowered Chinese, an empowered Russians, and a lot of other mischievous characters taking advantage of, um, of the new isolationism that we're experiencing. And, and Milena, you mentioned a few moments ago in passing the International Space Station, but I want to talk about this because this is one of the more really intriguing aspects of this whole crisis. Who would have thought that not only the International Space Station, but all of the satellites that the United States launches are dependent on Russian boosters. Exactly. So, so exactly. he's, and, and Putin has mentioned this to us, right? Yeah. So basically Russia's deputy prime minister, uh, Rogozin, announced um, just recently a series of punitive measures against the U.S. in response to um, a, p a potential sanctions imposed um, on Russia, which included, for example, the lack of cooperation when it comes to the International Space Station. So the International Space Station has been traditionally manned by both um, American and Russian crew, but the only way for the United States to reach it is by using Russia's spacecraft or booster, as you correctly pointed out, called Soyuz. So if they pull right. out, we cannot reach the but International Space Station. As I understand, it's even worse than that. So the space station, its uh, orbit, Orbiting, yeah. it, it decays a little bit. And then it has to, every couple of uh, weeks, be boosted up. And its rockets that do that boosting are the Russian rockets. Exactly. And Russia's now saying, well, we're going to bring it down. Well, so, I mean, you know, again, I, I think it goes back to Shannon's earlier point about is this just a poker move, right? Or mm -hmm. would they actually do it? I think it's similar to, you know, would they actually cut off the European supply of, of, of oil and gas? Mm -hmm. It might be that they're just threatening, you know, we're going to do this if you impose sanctions. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I mean, maybe this is of slightly lesser strategic importance than the oil and gas for Europe, but, but you know, it's a huge move. I don't I don't yeah. think that they would actually do it. And I could it. see this bad PR value to letting the International Space Station freedom, you know, fall exactly. down. Yes. <laughs> but on the other hand, our satellites, our, our spy satellites that we send yeah. up go up on Russian boosters exactly. as well, <laughs> which is really weird when you think about it because they're yeah. spying on Russia, yeah. but they're giving it to us at a high price and we're using them. And they could delay delivery, yeah. and that would mean that we can't see what's going on. And that might be an intermediate move that has less 
negative Absolutely. PR value. Absolutely. I and, I mean, and, so, and so I think that's, that's, you know, Putin, I think, is much more likely to do something like that because that fits into his rationality because I absolutely mm-hmm. agree with Shannon that I think he's a rational player mm-hmm. and he'll do whatever it takes to boost the Russian interest, but not the, at the expense of alienating everyone and risking all these, you know, sanctions and military intervention against Russia. So he, he could do something like that. But, but I think all that points to is that we have to be, I think, extremely careful as to how we deal with Putin. And I think coming up with the, with the strategy and policy is actually a lot harder to, to do than to actually, you know, say we should do it. I mean, I, I think it's, it's really, really difficult. So when I put it all together, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of when people were saying the United States is becoming so interdependent and interconnected with China and Russia that we'll never go to war. <laughs> And what it sounds like is, guess what? All we've done is given them all sorts of weapons to use against us that aren't necessarily military weapons and can be ratcheted up, but can be used to paralyze us from doing anything significant to stop their incursions. And and we're going to see probably Putin continue to do these incursions and China to do these incursions and the kinds of tools that we have at our disposal, what we're learning today, all have negative consequences. There's no good choices. Is that I, what you're I, saying? I, I absolutely agree. And I mean, if, if you look back, the other thing is that nobody's mentioned this, but let's remember that in, in sort of in terms of military history, nobody has ever won a war against Russia. You know, <laughs> Hitler <laughs> tried and Napoleon yeah. tried. Nobody has ever you know succeeded. And I think China has yeah. a, a relatively similar history. So mm-hmm. I, I think you're right, Michael. Yeah. All right. Well, let's use this as our theme to wrap up the broadcast. <laughs> our experts have told us that we may be standing on the edge of another Cold War. We've learned some sobering things today about the trend in U.S.-Russian relations and also the limits of what we can do to respond. If you'd like to weigh in on the discussion or suggest a topic for an upcoming broadcast, please send an email to talkingforeignpolicy at case.edu. I want to thank again our panel of experts, Paul Williams of the Public International Law and Policy Group, Professor Malena Stereo from Cleveland Marshall College of Law, and Dr. Shannon French from the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence. I'm Michael Scharf. You've been listening to Talking Foreign Policy, produced by Case Western Reserve University and WCPN 90.3 IdeaStream. Talking Foreign Policy is a production of Case Western Reserve University and is produced in partnership with 90.3 FM WCPN IdeaStream. Questions and comments about the topics discussed on the show or to suggest future topics, go to talkingforeignpolicy at case.edu. That's talkingforeignpolicy, all one word, at case.edu.